Hi everybody and welcome to our last unit of the year for Honors Chemistry, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and in this unit, what we're going to do is we're going to review a little bit about net ionic equations and then um, be able to go on ahead and solve what are called redox problems. So let's get right to that review. A lot of the reactions that we've looked at this year have occurred in aqueous solution, which means that we've dissolved substances in water. There's three main types, all right, and we have actually done all of these um, this year in lab. There are precipitation reactions. Remember, we did a lot of those. Those are those double displacement reactions. There's acid-base reactions, all right, or neutralization reactions, they're also called. And then redox reactions, which we're going to specifically be looking at in this unit. All right, if you recall from semester one, we had you guys use the solubility rules to determine if an ionic compound was soluble in water. All right, and that's important in our review of net ionic equations. So what I'd like you to do is you can pause the video and you can review these um, rules really quickly and then go on ahead and fill out the chart as to whether those compounds are soluble or insoluble. All right, welcome back, and let's take a look. Remember, if this video goes too fast, you can certainly pause it. Also, I have these notes on um, my MCPS. So there we go, I used the solubility rules. I determined whether these compounds were soluble or insoluble. I know I'm going pretty quickly through this, but this is review for everybody. The second portion here asked for the above salts that are soluble, write out the ions that they form in aqueous solution. So let's just take a look at this first one. All right, so I have iron three iodide, which um, is a solid, and then I'm gonna dissolve it. And that's what the arrow is showing in this particular process. So I'm dissolving it. When I dissolve it, because I did determine that this is a soluble compound, it is going to um, turn into Fe3+, plus, all right, the ion iron, and now it's aqueous, all right, which means it's dissolved in water. I am also going to get three iodide ions because the original solid had three iodides there. So this is what I'm talking about, about writing actually what ions form, all right? And again, that's gonna be really helpful when you do the net ionic equations, all right? Again, you can take a look here, pause if you need to, to take a look at those, and then certainly you can look at the notes on my MCPS. Some other things to keep in mind, um, we're not going to talk a whole lot about this in this um, for us this year, but if you're going on to take AP especially, uh, when writing net ionic equations and dealing with acids, strong acids you treat as soluble and they break apart. So for example, hydrochloric acid is strong, so in a net ionic we would write that as H plus and Cl minus. Whereas a weak acid, like acetic acid here, we actually leave whole, we don't break it up because only such a small percentage of those hydrogens turn into ions. Again, it's not gonna really come up a whole lot um, for us this year, but if you move on in chem, that's gonna be important. All right, so where do we usually use these net ionic equations? Uh, we have seen or the, con the ones we're going to be look at are single displacement reactions, which are really going to become important because that's going to be your lab, your grade for this week. Double displacement, which we did a ton of last semester. All right. And then a little bit of acid-base reactions. So there's three. Oh, there we go. Sorry, computer's not cooperating. All right. There's three type of equations, technically. We have what are known as molecular equations, which is the equations we've been dealing with all year. Ionic equations show soluble compounds as ions, just like we did above. And then if you recall from first semester, net ionic equations actually take out any spectator ions. And a spectator ion is one that doesn't change from the left to the right. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about there. All right, so right here, and this is gonna be a reaction that comes up again and again in this um, discussion, silver nitrate and magnesium. Well, well, remember silver nitrate, I don't have it written here as aqueous, but it is. Anytime you have an ionic compound, you can assume that it is in solution because it's the only way we're going to have it react. So this is a solution of silver nitrate and then magnesium written all by itself. That means I'm dealing with magnesium metal. It's just Mg. So the traditional or what we call molecular equation is the first one I have written here, all right? AgNO3 plus Mg, this is a single replacement. Magnesium is going to replace the silver, giving me MgNO32. I need two, because remember the charge of magnesium is plus two, whereas the charge of silver here was plus one. And now I am left with um, silver metal on the right. 
So when I write the ionic, all I'm doing is taking the silver nitrate and I'm writing it as its ions. Two silver ions plus two nitrate ions. Magnesium stays the same. What's it giving me? A magnesium ion, two nitrate ions, and two silver metals. All right, well, my spectator ion in this equation is nitrate. So that gets crossed out. Nitrate did not change from the left to the right of the reaction. All right, the other two, however, silver and magnesium certainly did. Silver went from having a plus one charge to having no charge at all. That is a huge difference. Remember, charges matter. All right, as we continue on, um, you'll see I have a double replacement reaction here. And my traditional reaction, great, just double displacement, great, we switch partners. This is a precipitate reaction, which means we formed an insoluble com um, compound, our zinc carbonate, that stays whole. So when I do my ions, all right, my zinc carbonate does not turn into ions because it is insoluble, it's gonna stay as a solid. So the only things that changed here were the zinc ion and the carbonate ion because they turned into a solid. Your sodium and your nitrate are your spectators. All right, down here with our acid-base reaction, we've got hydrochloric acid, strong acid, so I write it as H plus and Cl minus. Sodium hydroxide, all sodium compounds are soluble, so sodium ion and hydroxide ion, all right? And then it's gonna give me sodium chloride, table salt, and water, H2O. So what's changing? Well, the only thing that's changing is actually the hydrogen ion and the hydroxide to give me water. The sodium and the chloride are spectators. You can go ahead and um, pause the video now if you'd like to go and do the next sheet in your notes. That's some good practice and I'll show you the answers. And again, these will be up on my MCPS. All right, welcome back. Let's look at our first equation here. In this case, we did not form an insoluble compound. So all you ended up with were spectator ions. You basically just mixed a bunch of ions together and nothing happened. So in the end, this is a no reaction. For number two, we did form barium sulfate, which is insoluble. And in number three, we formed copper two phosphate, which is insoluble. So that was a nice little review of our net ionic equations. Again, those of you going on to AP chemistry are going to really find that useful. I want you to stick with me for a couple minutes because we're going to actually start the next you, um, the next part of the notes, just a couple sentences, and then I'm going to lead you into your practice. So we are going to talk about what are known as oxidation reduction reactions, which get the shorthand redox reactions. All right. Redox reactions are reactions that specifically deal with the transfer of electrons from one substance to another. All right. Some weird terminology that you just kind of have to get used to. The element that loses an electron is said to be oxidized. The element that gains an electron is said to be reduced. I know that seems weird, it's just the way that it is. Here's the little saying that we use to remember this. Leo the lion says, grr, lose electrons oxidized, gain electrons reduced. Well, one thing you're gonna be responsible for doing is actually figuring out what's gaining and what's losing electrons. And we do that by assigning oxidation numbers. All right, an oxidation number is very similar to a charge and we're used to charges. You know group one has a plus one charge. All right, so um, we are very comfortable with that. There are, however, some rules for assigning oxidation numbers, and you can find these rules on the back of your periodic table if you still have them. If you don't, don't worry. We can go into your practice. Oh, I'm sorry, that went away. Here we go. Here's your practice that you're gonna be doing on assigning oxidation numbers. It looks very cumbersome. It's not too bad, all right, these rules, and certainly reference them. So the first rule, and I'm just gonna talk you through some of the ones that might be a little complicated. Um, the first rule is the oxidation number of a pure element is zero. So that just means a pure element, if I'm looking at number three, that's carbon all by itself. It's just sitting there all by itself. It's gonna have an oxidation number of zero, all right? Also, if you have like O2 down here, O2 is considered all by itself, all right, because it is a diatomic molecule, it is going to have an oxidation number of zero. Same thing here for P4, okay? The uh, rule number two, the oxidation number of a monotonic ion 
is equal to the charge on that ion. So here, Mg2+, plus, what's the oxidation number? It's 2+, plus. so don't overthink that. All right, the more electronegative element in a binary compound, okay, um, is assigned the number equal to its charge. This isn't really gonna be one you have to deal with a whole lot, but here's a good example here. So in this case, I've got N2O3. O3 is always, or I'm sorry, oxygen is always gonna be negative two. Okay, so you're, you know oxygen, it's negative two. It happens to be more electronegative than nitrogen, but you're gonna remember oxygen's negative two. If you know oxygen's negative two, negative two times three is negative six. I need to figure out nitrogen. What times two is going to give me positive six, because we're gonna learn this all has to be zero, and that's gonna be positive three. All right, um, so this is just kind of like solving little baby puzzles as you go through. Okay, and you can kind of read these. Oxygen, as I said, is gonna be negative two. You've got a couple exceptions. I'm not gonna be asking you any of the exceptions. Hydrogen is gonna be plus one, all right? If you're in group one, you're plus one. Group two is plus two, aluminum is plus three. Eight and nine are really important. The sum of the oxidation numbers in a neutral compound will be zero, and that's what I was referring to with the N2O3. The whole thing has to equal zero, so if you know oxygen is negative two, you can figure out what N2 is. If you're dealing with a polyatomic ion, so for example here, sulfite, SO3, two minus, the charge of the whole thing has to be um, the same as the charge of the polyatomic ion. So as I look at that, I say to myself, well, I know oxygen's negative two. Negative two times three, because there's three of them, is negative six, all right? Well, what's sulfur gonna be? I need the whole thing to be negative two. So if I already have negative six, that means sulfur's plus four. So I want you guys at this point to go on ahead and do this practice sheet. The answer key will be online. All right, and then tomorrow we will actually jump into redox reactions. Thanks so much. Have a good one.